All right, good evening, everybody, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending on the part of the world you're in. This is the second learning we're doing. It's my pleasure to have worked with Yaakov Walker, James Walker. And as we're getting started, I just want to make sure you understand how we ended up with this learning today. As you know, at the last learning we did, at the end, I asked you guys to vote on the next learning, which would have been this learning, and people want to hear about matrilineal and patrilineal descent. But we actually got so many questions about CCO, and I spoke to Yaakov, and he said that he would love to address this topic. Very happy to have him here and have all of you here as well. Okay, so, so most of you know who Yaakov, James Walker is. He's not going to brag about himself, so I will do the bragging for him. He was the translator, is the translator of a book called Esther Explained. It's Megillat Esther, the Scroll of Esther, with commentary by Hacham Yaakov ben Reuven or Jacob ben Reuven. Those of you who were on their last learning where we talked about Tefillin and Mezuzot, we actually cited something by Yaakov ben Reuven, obviously not the section from Megillat Esther, but from somewhere else. And James is the one who actually went to the manuscript and got that information for us. James is also a contributor and translator on various upcoming works with the Kerry Press. He was a semi-finalist in the North American division of the State of Israel's Hebrew Tanakh competition. And if I recall correctly, there were 12 people who went to New York for this final competition. And Yaakov was one of those 12 people. He's a lay prayer leader at Temple Israel, the largest conservative synagogue in the Carolinas. And he's also a Misharet, uh, which is an assistant spiritual leader of, at the Hebrew family of Charlotte. Just a reminder for everybody, if you want to support Karite Jewish Research, you can donate through a bluethread.com, through the thekaritepress.com. You can buy a book from the Karite Press. All of this money goes to enhancing other Karite works. All of our paperbacks are $25 or under. Okay, so without further ado, I'm actually going to turn this over to Yaakov. Um, he's going to take us through the rest of the slides. I will obviously monitor the questions and make sure that I'm here to help as well. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and type them in and we'll get to them in due time. Thank you very much, Sean. So I appreciate this opportunity. The Karai Press is certainly something that we're all excited about. In the last year, we've had hundreds of people get books that have been newly published. For example, Esther Explained, we're going to go into some other examples of books that this learning hopefully might show um, new relevance for uh, in your life as you grow in your knowledge of the ways of the Holy One of Israel. Let's get started with the virtue of lifelong learning. And of course, a virtue in the highest level is a blessing. So we definitely want to um, give thanks to God who gave us the Torah. Um, we give you thanks, O Lord, uh, for your righteousness, which lasts forever. Give me, O Adonai, the words that I would speak truth to your people. I want to keep something in mind. Um, when we talk about hachamim, big misconception about karaim, about people who follow scripture, is that we don't have authority figures. We're kind of uh, autonomous, go it aloneers. It's not biblical. It says in Proverbs 9, 9 through 10, give instruction to a hacham, Keep that word in mind, a wise man, a wise person, and he will yet come, he will become yet wiser. Impart knowledge to a righteous man, a sadiq, and he will increase his information. The beginning of wisdom, chokhmah, same root as hacham, is the fear of Yah, or Adonai. And the knowledge of holy things, da'at keboshim, is understanding. So when we go into this perspective, we're going to study holy things, and it is not meant to make you money. It's not meant to make you more popular. It's meant to draw you closer to your creator. That's true understanding. That's true wisdom and understanding. But at the same time, the concept of a hacham is a person who has a voracious appetite to be a, long, a lifelong learner. And so that is our view of a hacham. We use the term rav or rabbi more in the sense of like a master like the way that a person might have a master's degree. Uh, but the highest virtuous title in the Karaite community, and in fact, many Sephardic communities, is a hacham, a person who who's just loves to learn for its own sake. And in order to, to prove the point, I would love to show you the words of a hacham who lived in the 900s and early 1000s. Yaakov al-Kirkisani. Yaakov or Yaakov was a hacham who 
was dealing with what we see on Facebook today and, and many communities online that are um, exploring how to live by the Tanakh, lots of infighting, lots of uh, disruption, disruptive battles between people who should be allies in the faith of Israel. And of course, the age-old contentions between rabbinic Jews and non-rabbinic Jews. And what he said is this, when studying scripture, meditating on passages, he says that in order to keep from doing these things, where we keep tearing each other apart, duties, the quote goes, should, must be elicited only by study and investigation. That which investigation imposes and to that which study leads, it must be adopted. Whether it is the opinion of the Rabbinites or Anan bin Dawid, the um, first prominent leader of Karaites, or yet others. Well, what's more, if scholars, hachamim, researchers, or others should arrive at a conclusion which has never before been put forward, this is to be adopted insofar it, it, is, uh, it is not to be impugned and contains no fault. All that's saying is we should focus on the facts. We should love facts. We should love truth. We should love information. It doesn't matter if it's in the Talmud, if it's actually helping us understand the Tanakh in its own context better than our own understanding, we should adopt it. If the Talmud takes something out of context or adds to the Torah, we should have the wisdom to find those passages and judge accordingly. In the same thousand-year-old spirit of peace and understanding, if we do have any differences with our rabbinic brothers, it is ultimately so that we can understand how do we go back to the words of God and, and not rely only on the words of men. So we have this idea of a blue thread. Sean, of course, named the uh, blue thread um, blog uh, based on the scriptures that we're going to go into, but it's far more than a piece of dyed string. How does this have to do with sanctification? We're going to get to the sanctification, but we all need to make sure we understand also what threads we're talking about. Some of us, of course, are new to the Torah. We may have not even reached the part of the Torah that deals with this commandment. If you're just reading the Bible from the beginning to the end in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. Join me as we just return to the words of the Creator and look at Numbers 15, Bamidbar, the book of what happened while they were in the desert. The Greeks called it um, basically Numbers. Numbers 15, 38, 39, and 40. That's the core of what we're studying. We give thanks to God for the giving of the Torah. Let's read the verse. It says, Daber b'nei Yisrael, speak unto the children of Yisrael. And bid them that they make them throughout their generations fringes on the corners. The word corner there is kanaf of their garments. And that they should put on the fringe sisit. Okay. The word fringe and sisit will be used interchangeably. Sisit, some people spell and pronounce. Tzitzit or tzitzis, we use a, an Eastern pronunciation, of each corner, of each kanaf, a thread of blue. And that particular term for blue is called techelit. And all of these highlighted terms are points that we're going to kind of unwind, pun intended, uh, as we go along. The next verse we're going to look at is, And it shall be unto you for a fringe, a tzitzit. That you urithemoto, and you shall that you may look upon it. Uschartem is called miswot ya, yarasithemotham. And remember all the miswot, all of the commandments of Yah, the Lord, and do them. And that you do not go about after after your own heart, and your own eyes. Which after which you used to go astray. And the last verse is that you may remember and do all my commandments. And he goes on to and be holy unto your God, your Elohim. And he again says that he is Elohim who brought us out of Egypt. Elohim, the divine power God who brought us out of Egypt in order to be our supreme, most high God, and that he indeed, or as he says, Ani Adonai Eloheichem, I, Adonai, or Yah, am your God. That's the verse that's not included in this passage, but 
if we take that in mind, we have a lot of communities who've looked at that passage and celebrated it. We have European Karaite Talith. As you can see, the Talith is very different than what many people consider a Talith in a, uh, who have belong to a Western synagogue, for example. Uh, the Talith is on a garment that doesn't look particularly familiar uh, in this part of the world or in this time in history. And yet you can see, notice the blue fringes that you find uh, along with white fringes. That same passage, but through the lens and the fog of translation into classical Ethiopic, has been turned into a natella, which is, in fact, the root of the same word is talith. Talal is to shade, to, cause, co to cover from the sun. And so here you have fringes, and here, instead of it being a color, a particular color along the, of the corner fringe, the word kanaf is sanaf in Ethiopic, and so that is the hemline. So here you see the similarities in sounds. Kanaf means literally extremity or edge or border or hem or direction. And so that has been variously interpreted so that there is a a cord in, or a, in the sense of a cordon, a, a, a ribbon that is woven of bright color. And, the, and now as of course many Many hun over a hundred thousand Ethiopians uh, have been settled in Israel. There is now uh, an increasing tendency to add uh, CCOT to the edge of the traditional natella. This is my wife Leah, who's wearing a handwoven natella that was given to us by our friend, uh, a man and his wife, uh, who are millennials who faced persecution in Addis Ababa for being Beta Israel. And they helped, uh, we helped them get asylum status here. As a gift for that, they have a tradition of actually uh, hand weaving the Natella. It's not something they buy in a store. Colors happen to be the colors of the Ethiopian flag, to which we added a Sephardic style um, seat seats with blue thread. And so this is her, what she wore to um, services um, recently. And of course, filmed on a common day. We also see our Samaritan brothers. The Northern Kingdom um, had many uh, people in the land of Shomron uh, that were priests that intermarried with Assyrians, according to the Tanakh, who engendered a controversy regarding their changes that they introduced in the tor into the Torah to um, oppose the building of the temple, but having a fringed garment draped over the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, um, alone with no blue threads, but with blue stripes in it, seems to be, again, another mixture of how over time as slight variations of understanding the Torah developed that certainly a fringe garment was a part of the heritage of all communities of Israel, um, but not in exactly the same way. And a beautiful ending picture on this section, section out of the diverse tapestry of approaches to this commandment are this picture of two uh, um, young uh, celebrants in Israel, in a, in a Beit Knesset, among the Karai Jewish community. And you see not only uh, a young uh, lady or uh, a girl holding a Sefer Torah with her head covered, and a young boy as well, but most importantly, that the Talit has, as every Karai synagogue in the world currently does have, from Israel to Daly City, uh, California, a distinct long uh, tzitzit with blue mixed in each single tzitzit into each single fringe. As we progress from Eastern Europe to Samaria to Ethiopia to now Egyptian Karaites who live in Israel and America, there's a lot of consistencies here. We're not here to, again, um, find what's wrong, we would like to find what's what's right. And we could certainly see there's a lot that we have in common. I'd like to poll everyone, just out of curiosity. Um, how often do you wear CCOT? We'll give you uh, just uh, about 30 seconds here. And so we see that many people follow the, the tradition of wearing only during prayer. And many people are also in the category of wearing them daily. Uh, and some are honest in saying that they virtually never never wear them. If you ever hear about people wearing fringes every day, 
not that's not something that's let's say most non-orthodox communities push very hard many people may not feel comfortable going outside of the their community and not wear them so we're not being judgmental here um we certainly saw that the winning position was having fringes on during prayer not at all times karaites historically were divided about this as well and the current practice among karaites is often to don a talit as their rabbinic colleagues do only during prayer services um, first, it was out of persecution. Now that we live in a place of freedom of religion, those age-old traditions that were created under persecution of hiding tzitziot from public view of Gentiles have continued. To me, I wear them every day. It's very personal to me. We have a photo of how do I wear them. I actually am an entrepreneur. I run a startup. Um, and I uh, give lectures at, at universities. And so I'm a, in, in the public eye quite a bit. Um, and yet, as you can see, you can wear tzitziot, even if you're trying it out, in a way that's rather discreet. You don't have to have four long fringes hanging around down to your knees all the time and kind of, you know, a way that may, might make you feel less inclined to do it. But at the same time, you can wear them where colleagues and friends will notice, hey, what are those fringes for? And I think that question of what are those fringes for, and as it happened just today at a at a business uh, convention uh, where someone says, I saw your, your talit was on, and uh, we started up a conversation and the guy turned out growing up in Israel, there's a reason that we can see them. It says prophetically in the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 23, the following. Thus says Yah Sevaot, Yah of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all of the languages of the nations, of the Gentiles, shall even take hold, not to the garment as the JP, old JPS says, but it says to the kanaf, the same word used for the corner or the edge of your garment, the location where CCO should be, it shall take hold of that kanaf. Of him that is a Jew, it says, "Kanaf ish Yehudi of a Judahite, a man of Judah, a Jew, saying, we will go with you because we have heard that Elohim, God Almighty, is with you. That, as a, a person who did not grow up in this way of life, who grew up in a Christian household, the son of very pious Christians, is something that shows not only the fact that it is a beautiful prophecy poetically, but it is something that actually happened in my life. I saw people doing this and I wanted to learn more. And here I am able to teach other people about the commandment. This is now getting into our interconnectivity. We talked about spiritual life. The prophets understood the spiritual role of, of the kanaf and why the kanaf of an Israelite, the location of a tzitzit was, was important. Let's step through some of those words that we saw. What do we see that's in common when we think of holiness, we think of some of these images. If you look in closely, the tabernacle, beautiful place of worship that would prefigure the temple that we see so many chapters devoted to in the book of Exodus. When we think of holiness, we think of Shamayim, right? The beautiful skies above that symbolize the throne of glory. We think of the Kohen Gadol, the attire, the dignity, the prestige, of, a, of the people who devote themselves to be priests and now the chief priest among them who explain and interpret the laws of the creator. And then, of course, here we have Techelet itself uh, from our own Azrael Kautek, who is in Canada and has provided the original processor as much as she could find of deriving this color from plants. What brings all of these things together? It's Techelet. Techelet is in all of these aspects. And if we look carefully, aspects of, of holiness, if we look at Parashat Teruma, and we drop down a little bit, it says, okay, we think about offerings. Sometimes people think of these as very boring passages, but Teruma is about when they left, when Israel left Egypt, they were given gifts uh, and gold, of gold and silver and jewels when they were rushed out of Egypt by the Egyptians. And so after 
a process of time, the opportunity came to give those back to the creator in a, a very sanctified and uplifting way. One of those things was their source of blue dyed threads and fabrics. Techelet was to be used. And this was a grand collection for things that would be used, as it says in verse 25, verse 4 in Exodus. Blue, techelet, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair. These things will be crucial ingredients, or not ingredients, but materials and fabrics that will be used to make, as it says in the following chapter, the Mishkan, the dwelling place of the Creator, the tabernacle, to have curtains, a fine twined linen, and blue, techelet, purple, scarlet, the keruvim, which are uh, a kind of uh, symbol of angels, the work of skillful workmen, you shall make them. And says, after giving these curtains and all of the designs that basically will decorate the first place of worship built exclusively for the glory of, of God outside of a, a small altar, it says that you shall make a loops of blue upon the edge of one of the curtains. What you'll find many times is that petil, um, twisted cords, and techelet, again, are a part of the mindset of the Israelite far before the commandment back in Numbers. They thought about that when they were weaving the designs of the tabernacle. And so it's, in a sense, democratizing something that was so holy that, again, Moses himself had received this vision of techelet, not only in the tents of the tent of meeting, but on the holy garments of Aaron, his brother, and all high priests and all Kohanim for, that are offering service before the Creator for every generation to come. It says, You shall make in 28, verse 2 of the same book, holy garments for Aharon, your brother, for splendor and for beauty. And they shall bind the breastplate plate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a bled, with thread of blue. That's the first time or one of the first times that we see petil techelet. Petil techelet, again, is a petal is for, to twist or inter, inter, interweave. Here it is, techelet, of all colors. Not just kahol, which is the modern Israeli color for blue, but the word techelet. Here you also see that not only are the, is there a breastplate, this metal rectangular shield with the 12 uh, stones, or, uh, gemstones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel in it, strapped up around the neck of the high priest, so to speak, or over the shoulders of the high speak with this basically giant tzitzit, you know, this big blue thread, or threads of blue, but it says you shall make a robe of the ephod of all blue. This ephod is, again, kind of like the robe that we saw those high priests wearing, uh, the robe that we saw um, even in the traditional kara'ed attire, of uh, this lengthy kind of uh, um, the, uh, the upper garment of a flowing robe. It's called an ephod. And again, that will be made out of blue entirely, out of a techelet blue. So you would have had this in mind as an Israelite, that this is the color of holiness. So what we find here in a book that we'd love you to take a look at by Gabriel um, Wasserman. The Caribbean Press just published it. It's called Royal Attire, Levush Malchut, on Karaite and Rabbanite beliefs. An excellent parasha by parasha guide on how we differ in our approach to the Torah. Take a look at the approach on the commandment of tzitzit. We'll just read um, briefly here, but emphasize some of these highlighted points. It says, at the end of chapter 15 of this book of Numbers, is written a commandment of tzitzit, tassels or fringes. And it says, and the techelet string on the tzitzit. Here too, the Talmudists, or the Talmudists, people who follow the Talmud as their source of understanding the, the, way, the will of God, have invented something that the giver of the Torah never considered. They say that techelet is a green yarok dye, dyed with the blood of the chilazon, which was a kind of worm that is found in the cities near the sea, and that it cannot be found now. Chilazon is today translated in modern Hebrew as a mollusk, but it is also, um, I think it is called the murex trunculus, um, basically a, it looks like a conch shell, shell uh, mollusk and that is exactly um, the view of the Talmud that it is a this, uh, this liquid extracted from a unclean sea creature that is the only source for techelet if you want to dye it. It says and this is not scripture's intention for techelet is not a green dye but rather it's similar to the color of the blue sky which is between black and white again the sky not in North Carolina or Canada 
or Australia, but the sky over the land of Israel, which is right next to the, the Mediterranean Sea. And that's which is in that region to say that it's somewhere between in the middle, not not a navy blue, basically, as something close to black. It's not a very pale blue that is close to white, but it's something that is distinct color in terms of its um, tone. And it says, and thus they have abolished this commandment and make their seat seat only with white threads, but our seat seat have techelet thread. We do want to also point out the Talmud says it was taught in the Talmud, in Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, in the section called Menachot, which deals with meal offerings, folio or page 43b, it says it was taught, Rav Meir used to say, why is blue, techelet, specified from all other colors because blue resembles the color of the sea and the sea resembles the color of the sky and the sky resembles the color of the throne of glory so here it shows that this tehelet whatever this shade is and however it is made it should be something that recalls the color of the sea and the sky and the throne of glory or all of the other things, as we just said in the Torah, that are connoted with holiness. And we must give um, due credit to our rabbinic brothers. There are communities that research sources even of the mollusk-driven, uh, der derived um, dye for techelet. Um, and even though we, again, disagree with the need to s extract the blood of an unclean animal or its mucus, and order to create something that is meant to represent uh, purity and holiness, we do commend the fact that there are thousands of Jews in Israel and abroad who are taking the extra step to have blue in their strings more directly. And we must, again, encourage that. There are many ways to approach this commandment, and we would rather have people attempt to do the commandments uh, than to fight over it and to not wear tzitziot at all. You can fulfill this commandment today too. If you have not already found that there are many Karaite sources today, meaning going to the land of Israel or going to resources like uh, our uh, Azrael Caltex um, website and others to procure techelet and make your own tzitziot or to go to Etsy or eBay, or and to just support those who are trying to make Karaite, Egyptian particularly, Karaite-styled tzitziot. If you haven't tried that, maybe you'll be interested in doing it today as you wear whatever kind of tzitziot that you have. We're going to point out in this commentary by another hacham, he explains the number of strings, the exact dye content of the strings, to try to make the techelet, the exact ingredient formulation. If you can't figure it out, then it's better for you to try than to not try at all. So it's 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 hopeful, it's uplifting. It's also a great excuse to introduce how uh, Karaite walks through certain ideas. So here we have a hacham who lives in the 1300s, so roughly 700 or 600 plus years ago. How did they deal with approaching the Tanakh? How we can grow in our understanding as 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 B'nai Mikra, as children of the scripture, by turning to earlier generations, rather than turning all early generations into an irrelevant source. When it says on that passage in Numbers 20, 15, 38, and they shall make for themselves sisit, it says, just as in the passage, and this word he's saying, this word sisit is just like the word in that passage, he took me by a lock, tzitzit, of my head. This is the prophet Ezekiel being taken in the spirit to see his 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 visions of Israel's future in Ezekiel 8.3. He says that that word tzitzit is referring to the hair-like threads that remain at the end of a garment's fabric, which are called fringes. Spiritually, before we get into the weeds of it, what he's saying is, is if we kept reading the books of the prophets, this word tzitzit is also used when God takes a prophet by the head, as it were, and whirls him away to this vision of the future. And just as you see the fringes, think of that passage. Think of passages that are uplifting and inspiring like that. And yes, also that it the shape of the tzitzit should then be something like a lock of hair, all right, on the corner of your garment. So you see that we're not adding, we're not being mystical with it, but at the same time, we cannot deny there are things that come to mind from prophecy. Grammatically, this word, uh, the morphology of the word tzitzit is diminutive, just like the name for a night creature, a creature of the night. So if li Laila is the night and Lilit is a little night thing, a 
nocturnal creature. Many translations say a, an owl, for example, in the book of Isaiah 34. Well, that means seat seat is a diminutive. It's a mini seats, mini seats. You know what is a normal seats? The word seats, sade yot sade sofit, is used as the name of what is on the head of the high priest, where it says kodesh layah or kodesh ladonai, holy unto the Lord or holy unto Yah. That was a plate that literally shone in gold, held together with twisted cords of blue, strapped around his head, and it's declared that this person is a holy man of God. So you have a mini version of that, four of them, on your garment. That's what he's getting at in terms of teaching the grammar. Powerful things when you really look at that, because it says when you look at it and you move your heart away from these temptations, you will become kedoshim ladonai elohechem. You will become holy. It says in its general sense, the meaning of tzitzit is something visual. So he's saying this word is so rich in its meaning that even as a verb, it says, that it's similar to the Song of Songs, which says, looking in at the windows, glancing through the lattice. The word glancing through is metzitz, from the verb satz, to look up. Now, even in modern Hebrew, if you want to say a tool tip, like those little pop-up tips, if you don't know what an icon is, it call, they call it a remez satz. Satz, same root as tzitzit. It's a remez that pops up. It's a remez that you just kind of look at, and it reminds you. Remez, I'm sorry, is a hint. It's a hint that you kind of look at really quickly. So that it shows you is to a Hebraic mind, tzitzit means many, many, many things. Something to look at. It's a little tzitz, this little plate that says, hey, I am holy too. It's also saying it's like the lock of hair that the prophets were kind of grabbed by uh, when whisked away in the visions of the Creator. And it says, where do we place the tzitzit? It says, now the scripture does not give instruction on whether the fringes are to be made from the same garment. In other words, if you have something um, to kind of take a knife and fray the edges of that garment in order to make seat seat, literally kind of like you do with tearing jeans, or whether they should be placed externally upon it. And so therefore it says they shall make seat seat. And it says, notice it doesn't say make seat seat out of the fringes, out of their garment. The way it says in Exodus 31 and 2, that you make an altar and then from itself shall its horns be. So in other words, all we're doing is we're letting the Bible explain the Bible. He's saying as a hacham, we're not making anything up. We're not trying to add to the Torah when we say that there are four things you should attach to your garment called tzitziot. It's even though this word can be like hair, something that kind of grows out of your body or fringes that are on the edge of the garment to be truly honest it says that you should put them on your garment not to know al tzitzit they should put them on your kanaf and it says even the the kanfe the the corners of their garments the plural language is similar to Deuteronomy 15:38 braided cords you shall make for yourself on four corners arba kanfot of your covering which you cover yourself with so we have now something called a gezerah shawa, shawa. That's a part of letting the Bible, literally, the Tanakh interprets itself. We have a number of ways of interpreting on the corners or literally on the edges or the extremities of your garment. And so it says, based on the fact that he said about those arba kanafot, they are your covering. This is something that you cover yourself with, but there also is some sort of talit. Priest, as we saw, it is acceptable to see this as a garment that you um, that is adorned, the same garment that has the same four edges of it adorned with these tzitziot. And it says, and you should place on a tzitziot of the corner. Oh, and one last thing, by the way. Amazingly, he's in the Middle Ages. He can be as mean and nasty as he wants. He doesn't have, there's no political correctness. Look at what he says. The Zarba Kanfot, they could be the rabbinic style. If that's the correct style, then as we said, so be it. Scripture does not give instructions, he says. How about the number of strings? As the rabbinites maintain, and they're similarly divided over, meaning that we're not going to start it to make it more specific than it needs to be. It has enough symbolism and meaning that you can be creative with it. Um, and here we have amongst our uh, rabbinic brothers, how did, what do they put on their four corners? Vilnagaon style. Vilnagaon was a 
uh, a an ingenious um, rabbinite scholar who lived in Eastern Europe in Vilna, Vilnius, which is uh, Lithuania. Very different style, as you can see. Lots of small horizontal loops of blue mixed in versus the traditional Ashkenazi and Sephardic style. So if you go to a typical Ashkenazi synagogue, this is the looping style. If you really were careful, you would notice that the number of loops is different, meaning loops of the binding thread that makes a uh, that separates between big knots versus the the pattern of how many winds that you make when you use a Sephardic style. And here, one uses rabbinic techelet, which is based on this dye from a mollusk, and one doesn't use any at all. It says, and they shall place on the seed teeth of the corner a cord of blue, and it says the twisted cord should have at least three threads. And he says this hints at Rachel's statement about the, uh, using the same verb of patal, to twist, to intertwine, to wrestle, to struggle, as we find in Genesis 38. When she was giving birth to the children of Jacob, and was having a lot of sibling rivalry with her sister, Leah. It says, as if struggling with God, Naftule from Patal, Naftule Elohim, have I struggled, Niftalti, with my sister, and I have prevailed. And so she called his name Naftali. So he's saying, if you do have these threads, if we want to be sentimental about it, we can't be authoritative. We can say it's an interesting reminder is we should at least have not just one little measly string to make a tzitzit out of, and it's just blue. Well, just as the word patal, patal, patal is used even in Genesis, before we even get to the holy stuff that's in the high priest's garments, the first way it was used was struggling with God, struggling with your sister. And so it should be, as the, as the um, Ecclesiastes says, as a three-ply cord is not easily broken, so too you should think about the struggles we have with others. These are things that are temptations that our eyes look at, that our hearts lust after, the lashing out, the bad mouthing, the lashon hara, all of those things remind us of why we're wearing tzitziot, and tzitziot remind us of why we shouldn't do those things. Women in tzitziot, one of the most interesting controversies today, we have the women of the wall, part of the controversy allegedly is that there are women who go to the Western Wall and without getting into the controversies, they wear talitot, and that is considered to be an affront to tzitziot as a commandment. Many early Karaites, and notice early, it's not like a modernization thing. It's not a, a controversial position that to, to these earlier scholars as, as much as it became later on, it seems, at least in the, the writings that we have preserved. A thousand years ago, 800 years ago, al Kisani, Levi bin Yefet, had, uh, um, uh, Hadassi, they wrote that women are entitled to the right to wear com the, the com any fulfill any commandment in the Torah unless it's specifically not for women. For example, being a high priest or something like that. Uh, and so, virtually all middle and later Karaites held that women were not obligated. And we find that these are often Karaites who find themselves under much more of a oppressive situation. There's much less religious liberty as well. Um, the lines were starting to have been drawn. Also, we also know, of course, that our current chief hacham, Moshe Firuz, who provided, who remarried us uh, as a couple and who uh, sponsored our conversion as well, has uh, been a great leader and is a, current, a great leader in Israel to this day in, in the Karai community, has said that, no, we should go back to the way the Mikra says it, that this is for all B'nai Israel, all Israelites, and that women are obligated uh, to wear them. As we just finish out, we do want to give due honor to those who are working hard on this. Go to the Ancients Blue website. I believe it's the Ancients Blue, Ancients, plural, blue.com. We have the dyes from Egypt that have been found archaeologically that are much more realistic than 603,000 Israelite men going to the shore and, and squeezing the blood out of a mollusk to make this techelet for the high priest garments. You know, there are, are plants that grow natively in, in Egypt and in uh, the surrounding areas to make woad and, and the dyeing process, which you can all find again at the Ancients Blue website. Again, are we going to continue to procure everything from rabbinic sources? Are we going to say that women can't wear tzitzit uh, because that's you know a rabbinic thing or it's now become an ideological thing between liberal and, and uh, orthodox forms of rabbinic Judaism?
or are we going to be genuine to our own tradition? We have to commend our Ethiopian brothers and sisters for continuing a unique style of wearing a, a talit that it has lots of beauty and splendor to it. And But at the same time, uh, we should find ways to encourage that same creativity amongst the Karaite community and also do so by uh, attaching proper TTO to the edge of them. The Karaite Jews of America is currently undertaking this. If you are creative with the uh, uh, designs uh, of uh, as it was in the Parashat Teruma, please bring your designs forward, bring your fabrics, your road, your dye. Let us know how uh, we can help you help our community. I'd love to open this up for questions during our remaining uh, time while we're still live. I want to turn it back to Sean at this time. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you very much. Very, very enlightening, very enriching. Uh, so some questions that came up that I had, and I thought maybe you should comment. So our, our Hacham, Hacham Aharon ben Eliyahu, he talks about how the Talit was ordained. And I just want your personal view here is whether or not you think that the Talit is a minimal requirements, meaning if we're praying, we should wear the talit, or is it something that you think was a later changed from once our garments changed from having four cornered garments? The same hacham, Aharon ben Eliyahu, he says that, yes, while the custom seems to be predominant among all Israelites to wear during prayer, that's the least likely time you're going to sin, in the middle of prayer, on Shabbat, in front of a congregation of Israelites looking at you. It's when you do masa umatan, give and take. In other words, when you're at business doing negotiating, you know, that's when you need to wear tzitziot. So even the Karait Hachamim who understood it was, yes, becoming a ritual garment, unfortunately, just like the Torah was, where we're not really studying it to learn. We're just studying it because it's the part of the Shabbat service to take out the Torah. They lamented that. Great. We have a, another question here. This one comes from Norm. It says, if both fringes and corners are plural, plural words, so the, how many fringes should be worn on how many corners? And if it is a thread of blue, is it only one blue thread? Um, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on what your personal views are or what our Hacham said on... Yes. So he says, essentially, but essentially, it says four because it's the Arba Kanfot should have a tzitzit. Tzitzit singular. Tzitziot is plural. So one tzitzit on each kanaf. Kanaf is actually used for directions even. It's not necessarily so important whether it's a square edge or not. There's a word pina, square edge, like a right angle. That word exact, word that phrase rather, arba kanafot, is used in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 12 when he talks about gathering all Israel, northern and southern kingdom, from places including Egypt, just like the Egyptian Karaites, may arba kanfota aretz, from the four corners of the earth. Not literally corners, of course, the earth is not square, that's why I'd say it's extremities. But there's a significance to four and corners in prophecy. And then the other question, just to follow up, he says, how many blue threads? And, you know, you, you, so you said a more of a spiritual answer there about the uh, sage saying this this verse about the struggles and it should be at least three blue threads um, mm -hmm. and he's being more spiritual and uplifting and not he's not being i use the term halakh yes yes he's commenting on on it's saying it's alluded to in these other verses but I, I think probably you and i would both agree that that's more of a tradition than a, a binding interpretation there pithil is something that is interwoven interwoven hence the word it can be used as wrestle you know, intertwined. If it, it can hold up a breastplate, think of a typical Karaite tzitzit. If you've ever seen one, it looks like a thick, kind of almost like a, a necklace, a gold necklace. It's interwoven. That's the same word, by the way, used. And I would say that would be a much stronger argument. The word pethil zahav is used when describing the gold chains that would be on the high priest as well. And just as if you look at a gold chain, um, not, not one that has just the links on it, but a chain that is long strands of gold woven. You can't have just two of them or it'll just untwist and it'll be two strands of gold. When you have three, you can braid. Anyone who has braided hair or braided strings or braided anything else uh, knows that that, as the book of Ecclesiastes says, a three-ply cord, cord made of three threads, is not easily broken. 
I would say that that explains how you can have something that stays together as a seat seat and doesn't completely unwind. That supplies an answer. And again, as he says, there is no specification on it, but logically, that is what we see in scripture as the word is used for something braided. All right. Any other questions? I do see a question that was asked and answered already on the attendee chat. The question was, where in scripture does it say that women are required? And the answer that in the attendee chat that was given is that basically this is an interpretation. The commandment is given to the children of Israel, uh, B'nai Israel, and uh, many commandments that apply to all of Israel are given to B'nai Israel, such as keep the Shabbat um, and things like that as well. So the Karai perspective says we were made male and female in the image of God, unless it's something like the laws of menstruation or the laws of childbirth or something very specific to our gender, that this is applying to all children. In fact, to all people, whether you are an ethnic Israelite or whether you migrated to become a, a part of the people of Israel, encouraging, as our chief Hacham currently does, women to take up tzitziot and, and do other things without compromise. And I think the, the, the world of Torah observance from reform to orthodox is really pining for that. So I think that's the bigger picture as well. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for joining. Thank you again to Yaakov. Thank you, everybody who came. Thank you. We uh, really appreciate it. This was uh, very informative, and I hope you found it practical and uplifting.